Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day we try to decipher the complexity of technology and bring you actionable insight from the forefront of innovation. And I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and today we've got an extremely relevant conversation in the context of the rapidly evolving technological landscape that's not just national, but global in its reach. Because today our guest is Rob Hayes, and he's the CEO of Atom Computing, and they're a company that's a front runner in the quantum computing space. And we've all seen the headlines around quantum computing, and it can be incredibly overwhelming and complex. So, But what sets Atom Computing apart from other solutions out there is, is they utilise optically trapped neutral atoms, which promises to bring about groundbreaking changes across various industries. But what does that actually mean? And how is it going to live up to its promise of bringing about groundbreaking changes across various industries? Well, Rob has a compelling point of view on why the US in particular needs to try and win that quantum race against global competitors. But in a world where policy, innovation and strategy are becoming increasingly interlinked, I want this conversation to shed light on the critical elements that could decide the fate of the US in the quantum arena. So we're going to discuss everything from public funding and government partnerships to talent retention and ecosystem expansion. We're going to try and unpack it all and inside 30 minutes. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to North Carolina, where we're going to dive deep into the world of quantum computing, the players, the stakes and the roadmap ahead. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are, and what you do. Hi, I'm Rob Hayes. Um, Thanks for having me. I'm CEO of Atom Computing. We're a quantum computing hardware platform company designing uh, quantum computing hardware from optically trapped neutral atoms. And uh, my background is in semiconductor and computer engineering. Previously, I worked at Intel for 20 years, ran the server processor product roadmap for them, and uh, worked at Lenovo for a few years as well as chief strategy officer for their data center group. Well, it's great to have you on the podcast today. You appeared on my radar when I was reading about the quantum race and how it's becoming a national imperative now. So can you articulate why actually winning the quantum race is so vital for the US, both in terms of technological superiority, but also things like national security? And and how does this align with Atom's computing's mission too? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, You know, when you look at quantum computing, this is one of these technologies that's been kind of an incubation for the last 20 or 30 years. There's been a lot of academic research going on and frankly, a lot of Nobel prizes won in this area over the last, you know, probably two or three decades. And it's finally getting to a point where companies are coming along and starting to develop the technology, not from a science perspective, but not an engineering perspective and really developing it to a place where these systems now work, although they're large or small scale today. Uh, But we're at a point where we're getting ready to scale these up and improve the performance and get them to a place over, I would say, the next five to 10 years where they will be uh, able to be deployed at commercial scale. And this is a once in a generation paradigm shift in computing performance that's going to be enabled. It's not going to be appropriate for all applications, but it's going to be appropriate for many applications where we're simulating uh, natural, you know, natural systems like physics systems and chemistry systems and things like this, but also optimization problems, machine learning enhancements. There's a number of applications that cut across many, many industries that quantum computing is really going to enable computational uh, you know, resources and capabilities that just haven't been practical before. And um, for both national security, you know, there are national security use cases around material science, energy, uh, cryptography, you know, a number of areas, cryptography gets a lot of attention, and that's clearly a you know a threat to our uh, you know to our our national security. But if you think about national security, is also built on the back of economic security, and being a leader in in an economic sense, or you know, on the world stage in the market, is also equally important to the United States and our allies. And as you know, computing and semiconductors really over the last fifty years or so have really led to a massive economic development and growth in the United States and put us in a, you know, helped us stay in a leadership position from national security as well. And quantum computing, I think, is just the next wave of that. And it's important that we lead in the next wave of technology, just like we've led in the last few waves of technology. So we maintain that economic security, which then leads to, you know, national security as well. 
And before you came on the podcast, I was doing a little research on you and I was reading how you've revealed six key strategies that the US could use to lead the quantum space, including increased public funding, diversified investments. But can you just give me a bit of an overview of these strategies, providing maybe a few concrete examples as well of how they can be implemented and and also the kind of impact that they could have if leveraged in the right way? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, the first one is just increased public funding. Like I said before, we're getting to a place where quantum information science and quantum computing are coming out of laboratories and academia and moving into commercial deployment. And we're kind of right at the cusp of that. And so it's appropriate for us as a nation to invest more. This is a venture capital money. This is large companies making internal R&D investments, but also the federal government and agencies investing in the technology. Um, That leads to government as a partner or customer. Oftentimes when you have a new technology wave, the government can really lean in and with funding and R&D collaborations can help accelerate the development of these technologies. And by, by being kind of an early adopter of those technologies, they help kind of create the flywheel or jumpstart the economic um, you know, engine of the industry. And so having you know different agencies or departments within the US government adopt and help collaborate on R&D is really important. So we, we for example, have had uh, a good collaboration for the last few years with like Sandia National Labs and University of Washington and Atom Computing uh, that's funded by the National Science Foundation, where we're developing some technologies that we're going to need for our future roadmap to help scale up the technology. And I think that's a very good example of a public-private partnership where we've got some U.S. government funding coming in. We've got some collaboration going on in R&D in the form of um, Sandia National Labs, and we've got private you know, money coming in and investment coming from our company as well as academia with the University of Washington. So that's a good example. We've got another partnership with NREL uh, and there's others that we're doing. I think it's also important, you mentioned diversification of the investment. So not only do we want more money to come in to help jumpstart this industry and accelerate the roadmap and ensure you know US leadership, but we want those investments to go across a number of different architectures and modalities. Because while we have an investment you know, and a bet on our architecture, it's not a foregone conclusion that our architecture is going to win or anyone else's architecture is going to win. So if you back up and take off, you know, sort of your company hat and you put on your your national, you know, kind of pride hat and you want leadership, you're going to need a portfolio approach. You're going to need to look at what are the leading horses in the race and you're going to want to bet on multiple horses to help advance all of them until we see what a, you know, when, when a clear winner starts to emerge and then we can double down on that. I think it's just a little bit early to do that. So diversification of the investment is really important at this point. Another one is talent, right? Because we know that you know deep tech innovation comes on the backs of smart people who are determined and you know have the grit to really uh, you know stick with it and persevere through developing these technologies and and uh, overcoming failures and you know eventually finding success. And so that talent and those people are critical to our success. And it turns out in quantum technologies, uh, it's obviously a very deep kind of physics. Uh, based um, uh, domain. And so there's a number of, um, you know, physics PhDs that are required to work at our company and other companies, as well as in the national government in order to advance the technology. And it's not only PhD talent, but the PhD talent is scarce and it's very valuable. And what we've seen is that there's, the United States has done a really good job of attracting the top talent from around the world, many, many nations, right, into our universities to get trained and do research. And it's important that we have, you know, export control and immigration laws that are favorable to keeping that PhD talent that we train in the U.S. in the U.S., right? So we want to make sure that this talent stays here. They came here to get trained. They work at companies like ours and others, and they want to stay in the United States. They want to grow their careers and their lives and their families here. And so we need to make it easy for them to do that. And Atom Computing is at the forefront of quantum computing, and you have a reputation for utilizing atomic arrays of optically trapped neutral atoms. And just saying that out loud makes it sound like something Doc Brown would say in Back to the Future. So for anyone <laughs> listening that's maybe a business leader, maybe a little bit outside of the tech industry, just wanting to understand a little bit more about a little bit more about it. Can you explain this technology to an audience and highlight its unique advantages and potential application so people can just understand what might be in it for them and their business. Yeah. It, this is one of these things that when you see it, you start to get it. And if you don't see it, it, it might go over your head. But yeah. um, basically, you know, today computers are solid state devices. They're based on, you know, semiconductor devices that have a bunch of transistors on them and they 
they do a lot of math and IO and things like that. So you have chips on boards and boards go into systems with power supplies and that's what computers look like. If you came into our lab and you looked at our quantum computing system, it would look very different from what you expect to see in a traditional computer and, and frankly, very different than what you've seen in probably the pictures. If you like Google quantum computer, you're most likely seeing an IBM, what they call a golden chandelier, which is this kind of beautiful device that hangs down from the ceiling and ultimately goes into a, a, a big kind of bucket, which has like cold liquid in it um, to, to cool it down. Um, ours looks very different than both of these. Ours is a, uh, it's a big optical table. It's got lasers. The lasers kind of shoot into these optical devices that are able to break the lasers into individual spots of light and control where those spots of light are in free space and very precise control of like the frequency and the amplitude and, and then the phase of the light, uh, that, that light ultimately goes into a, a small vacuum chamber. That's about the size of a softball with some small windows in it. Um, the light goes through microscope objectives into those windows and inside this kind of softball size vacuum chamber is a cloud of atoms, all of the same species. So we have, uh, both strontium systems and ytterbium systems. These are, these are atoms or elements that have a closed outer valence shell to electrons. Um, they're very, um, they call them neutral atoms because they don't interact with things around them very much. They're not charged particles. Um, and, uh, and what happens is when we shine this light in, these atoms get attracted to the, the kind of focal point of light. There's like a low potential well where the light has its, its greatest intensity and the atoms sort of rest in there and that's called optical tweezers. And so if you could you almost imagine like a magnet, like something getting attracted to a magnet, right? And when these atoms, this cloud of atoms is kind of floating around inside the stocking chamber hits these individual spots of light, you get one atom and you can isolate it. And then once you've isolated this atom, you can move it anywhere you want in free space and you can actually control its quantum states, the nuclear spin and the energy states of the electron cloud with different pulses of light. And this is, this is the science that's been developed over the last couple of decades in academia. And now we're applying it and there's other companies doing similar work, um, to, uh, creating a quantum computer out of this technology. And, and at the end of the day, you, you don't want to just have one spot of light in one qubit. You want to have many spots of light in many qubits. And so that's really the trick is how do you, how do you beam a bunch of light spots of light into this vacuum chamber and control them individually in a way that you can create computation between the atoms entanglement, superposition and some of the other, um, you know, quantum computing, um, states. Incredibly cool. Really is. And obviously governments are often accused of lagging behind in the, uh, the, the breaking neck speed of technology and the private space, the private industries there racing ahead but you i know you emphasize the importance of government partnerships in the quantum race so how do you envision these partnerships working and what kind of role should a government agency play in fostering innovation and accelerating development in in quantum computing what do you see here i think they come in different forms in our experience we've had um we've had a few of these so far and we're we're seeking more uh, because it's quite helpful for our roadmap at a highest level we kind of have a strategy where our, um, you know, our venture capital money and our revenue kind of fuels our commercial roadmap and getting our next generation products out the door and, and, you know, continuing to, to ramp our customer relationships. And then we have some government partnerships where those are really funding things that we need for the future. So looking out at our future roadmap and looking at what are the key enabling technologies that haven't maybe yet been proven or developed and tested that we could develop earlier if we had government funding to go do that, that would de-risk the future, but also accelerate the roadmap because all of those technologies feed forward into the commercial roadmap ultimately. And so when you think about it from the government's perspective, they, they think about it a different way, a few different ways. One is it's a strategic imperative. The United States leads in quantum technologies. We talked about that and why yeah. it's also important that, um, we leverage the technology to advance the mission of the individual agencies and departments, no matter what it is, whether it's a logistics problem for the government of which there's many in government, or whether it's some kind of a chemistry or energy problem that we want to go solve to maintain, you know, energy independence or efficiency. Uh, there's lots of use cases and the government has a vested interest in making sure that they're leveraging the, the best and the latest of the technologies in order to advance their mission. And so for all those reasons, uh, the government has a motivation to have leadership. And so they, uh, they seek out partnerships with companies like ours that are really, you know, kind of le on the leading edge of the technology development and trying to lean in and figure out how can they help. And, 
And that help comes in different forms. One is funding. Two is actual bringing scientists and engineers to the table that actually help us, you know, provide feedback or do code development and design with us. Uh, we've we've done a number of different models like that, and and it turned out to be quite helpful. Um, inside the DOE and the national labs, particularly, there's been a lot of um, quantum information science research and development over the last you know few years, and being able to tap into that talent and help us accelerate you know what we're doing has been quite valuable. And although we are talking today about the power of these complex technologies and the things that we can create as a result of that, of course, it's people right at the heart of this that's required to bring it to life. And you did mention earlier in our conversation that retaining talent is one of your highlighted strategies. So what are the specific challenges in attracting and retaining talent in the quantum field right now? Because I hear a lot about cybersecurity and there's a huge shortage of uh, cybersecurity qualified people, but how can the the U.S. ensure it continues to be the leader in quantum education and research and retaining people. I appreciate it's a huge question, but what are you seeing here? Yeah, I kind of think of it from two different sort of tranches of people. The the first tranche is the one I mentioned earlier, which is the you know the PhD physicists who have been studying you know AMO physics or you know quantum various quantum physics and chemistry for that matter, uh, and that scarce talent. They have very specialized areas of focus and research that they've done. And there's needs within companies like ours to go hire this talent. And uh, there's pool between other academic jobs, other companies. And so being able to make sure that we retain that scarce talent in the United States is important, but also feeding that pipeline and, and encouraging students that are coming out of maybe undergrad uh, in you know physics to go on and get advanced degrees or maybe undergrad in computer science and going on and getting advanced degrees in quantum information science and how do you how do you program quantum computers so that's kind of the first one is 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 feeding and retaining sort of that phd pipeline the second tranche i think about is is people that aren't phd's these are you know engineers computer scientists and um, business people that uh haven't even thought about quantum computing or quantum information science as a as an industry they might want to join. And there's a lot of, as we all know, there's a lot of um, competition for engineers and computer scientists and so forth across all industries. And even just within the computing or the cloud computing industry, you know, the giants like the Facebooks and the Googles and the Amazons of the world are, are employing the vast majority of these engineers and having them, un, you know, get trained and get inspired to want to come work for a small company that's in a nascent business like quantum computing, get trained on that and and jump in with the risks that are inherent with doing something new in deep tech is another challenge that we have. And uh, that's a training challenge, but it's also just a recruiting challenge and, and showing people that, you know, there's a strong career path in quantum computing. This is the next wave of computing technologies. It will be here for the next 50 years. And if you get in early, you have an opportunity to really be a leader over the long term in your career. But I don't think people have a lot of you know awareness of that yet. And so that's that's probably the bigger challenge, just creating awareness and motivation to do that. Percent with you. And I was also reading that you advocate for a seat at the table for startups and regional expansion of quantum ecosystems. So incredibly refreshing and exciting to read there too. So can you provide any insights into how these strategies might be realized and, and how they will also align with Atom Computing's approach to innovation too? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, you, you know, if you think about Clayton Christensen and the Innovator's Dilemma, you know, that famous book from, I don't know how long ago, 20 years maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he really laid out um, a pretty compelling argument for large companies have going businesses, they make profit off of technology that they developed and and grew a large customer base. And that becomes sort of the center of gravity for innovation within the company is how do you keep that sort of flywheel going or that or the, or the growth going within your core business. And and then many companies look at it and go, oh, but maybe I'm constrained. I need to I need to look out at some adjacent market or some adjacent new technology. I need to invest in that as well. And some companies, I would say Microsoft is a good example, have been able to reinvent themselves, you know, over the generations and kind of move from like operating systems to business applications to cloud computing services and business social media things like that but honestly most big companies are not able to kind of jump across and reinvent themselves and so what you see is 
most disruptive technology comes from startups. And a lot of that comes from, you know, Silicon Valley venture capital funded startups in the United States. Um, not exclusively, but that's been a very successful area. And, you know, we're one of those companies. And we believe that when the U.S. government, you know, Congress is setting policies for technology and appropriations and things like that, if they're only looking at the big companies, the companies that have been successful in the last generation of technologies to help influence where technology is going in the future or what the U.S. policies policy should be around that uh, technology, then we think they're missing a huge tranche of innovation. And so what we believe the United States you know, needs to do is actively seek out input from founders and technical leaders and business leaders within the startup community for these, you know, strategically important technologies to also have a seat at the table in advisory committees that are informing, you know, like right now we have the National Quantum Initial Renewal coming up, uh, hopefully in September. And, uh, you know, inviting companies like ours and others that are in the startup community who are 100% focused on advancing quantum computing technology is really important to get that well-rounded point of view and crafting what this next NQI, you know, initiative should be as an example. I think by having a seat at the table uh, for startups, I think we can better inform policymakers of the trajectory of the technology and the capabilities of the technology in a realistic sense, as well as uh, starting to influence some of the things that are important to us, like investing in a more diverse set of technologies. If we're only investing in the technologies that, for example, the big companies are investing in, and we're ignoring the technologies that the startups who have proven over time to be more disruptive in aggregate in the United States are investing in, then we will miss opportunities to lead the quantum computing race. And I think that would be a, a grave mistake by the United States. And so having a seat at the table, investing in a diversified set of technologies and increasing our chances of success through that portfolio approach, I think is really the the right path to leadership in the United States. And, you know, companies like Adam Computing and, and our competitors, uh, whoever kind of wins this race will benefit by that partnership. And of course, two huge components of everything we're talking about here are new regulations and international competition. So considering recent developments in regulations that are affecting investments in everything from AI and semiconductors to quantum computing, I'm curious, how do you foresee these impacting the US quantum race? And are there any potential risks and equally opportunities that you see on the horizon too? Yeah. First of all, most of my career was spent in the semiconductor space and Intel's, you know, number one semiconductor manufacturer. And I was an executive, you know, in one of the top two business units there. So I was in the center of a lot of the international kind of competition, primarily between the US and China over the last, you know, 15 years or so, as each of these, you know, giants, uh, superpowers was vying to have leadership. And it frankly got really messy in semiconductor. I mean, we've all seen it, right? Um, China declared in their um, 12 five-year plan that semiconductors, which was the number one import ahead of oil at the time, might still be, uh, was a strategic imperative for the country to have leadership in. Uh, they were behind Taiwan with TSMC in the US with, you know, Intel and and others. And, uh, and they started to require things like joint ventures and IP transfer, which was quite problematic for the US companies. And then the U.S. responded with uh, entity lists and cannot, you know, ship to certain companies within China. And then there were tariffs, and then there was the Chips Act, and it got very messy. And I think with quantum, those lines are being drawn a little bit early. There, first of all, in semiconductor, the the ecosystem was so intertwined between the U.S. and China, you really couldn't. It's very hard to disentangle, right? Because Chips might be manufactured in the United States or Taiwan, but they're sent to Malaysia or Vietnam or something for assembly test. And then they're sent to China for putting down onto motherboards. And they're sent back to other countries for assembly into chassis. And then they're sold worldwide. And that that whole kind of world is flat, intertwined um, ecosystem was very difficult to, to disentangle in semiconductors. And with quantum computing, I think those lines are being drawn quite early which has problems I'll talk about in a second, but also comes with opportunity to not make it quite so messy. And so I think what we're seeing is a little bit more like siloed ecosystems showing up in China, for example, and then the US and Europe kind of as a block. 
um, where there's collaboration between allied countries, but there's very little collaboration across more adversarial lines. And that will make it a little bit easier for companies to operate because they won't get so intertwined in the in the sort of supply chain and value chain, but it'll also limit our ability to uh, potentially innovate by leveraging the best of breed technologies that come across borders. It could also, it will limit our market accessibility, which means that there'll be less revenue and profit available to any individual company because we'll sort of be in different separated markets, which could be problematic as well. So I'm not saying we've got a a better situation here is just a different situation. And I think we we really need the policymakers and the regulators to think through how this is going to work because we do want to avoid the pitfall of missing a key technology that comes out of another market because we've put up barriers and dividing up the markets in a way that it's just less efficient and therefore the economic advantages and of you know having leadership in any area are diminished further from what they otherwise could have been and looking at the speed in which gen ai was able to enter the mainstream and dominate conversations in tw- uh, 2023 predicting the future is a lot harder than it once was but i'm going to still ask you to look into your virtual crystal ball at the future of quantum computing, how you see it evolving, particularly in the US, is there anything you see in there? And also, what role do you see atom computing playing in this future? And how do you align your strategies with that broader national imperative to lead this field? Because there's so much going on here, and I think a lot of it will appear much quicker than uh, a lot of people listening will realize. Yeah, most people don't understand the the R and D and the and the research that's happened, you know, up until now, and that we really are on the the cusp of of having a breakout in quantum computing. At the end of the day, we're all in a race to get to large scale fault tolerant quantum computing. Fault tolerant meaning you get the right answers. Of course, mm-hmm. you want the right answers, right? And in order to do that, you need a large number of qubits. You need high quality qubits. And this is the race that atom computing is running today. And we're not alone. But at the end of the day, we want the U.S. to win. We want to win as a company. We invest in the technologies and make choices that we think give us the best chance and advantage to win that race. And if we win that race, it's going to unlock tremendous value. You know, BCG says by 2035, when we get to fault tolerant computing, the market could be up to $650 billion of economic value created by quantum computing. That's a big number. Yeah. I don't know if it's the right number, but it's a big number. And that is going to be across many industries in you know, chemistry, pharma, logistics, transportation, defense, a number of different industries are going to benefit from this. And so trying to make sure that we win that race is really the prize that we've got our eye on. And we need to make sure that happens in the United States. And obviously, Adam Computing is doing our best to make sure that we're, you know, a leader in that space as we move forward. And I think that's a, a powerful moment to end on. But before we do finish today, I always like to have a bit of fun with my guests and find out a little bit more about their backstory, ask them to look back throughout their career. So my question to you is, what is the funniest or most interesting story that has happened in your career? Because I suspect there's been a few stories that you've picked up along the way, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm generally a pretty optimistic person and I find myself laughing a lot at work, which I think is a good place to be. But when I think back, what was the funniest moment? Uh, so when I was at Intel... I, I was, you know, executive Intel, and we would get together with our executives at our top customers frequently, maybe once a quarter or, or a little less frequently than that. And we'd have these quarterly kind of executive business reviews. And I remember one uh, one time, about once a year, we would try to do something offsite, a little bit more fun. We'd still have our business meetings, but we would try to get to know each other and do something sort of outside the office. So we'd do some kind of an offsite. And one time, several years ago, we had this Intel kind of business unit ex- executive team and this Dell uh, business executive team. And we all knew each other because Dell was a top customer of Intel and Intel was a top vendor to Dell. And obviously, you know, our fates are very intertwined. So these are people we knew very well. But we went to, um, you know, Intel's a Bay Area company. So we went to Napa for this business meeting this one time and had our business meetings at a hotel and went over to a winery. And they gave us, you know, a tour of the winery and a wine tasting. And then we were going to have like a nice dinner. And the dinner was going to be in the wine caves behind the winery. Like, you know, these. And so you, we go outside uh, after our meetings, our wine tasting and whatnot. And we're, we're walking out. It's it's fall. The sun is kind of setting. It's this beautiful golden sunlight that California is so famous for. 
and they had a photographer and they wanted to get a team picture of you know the intel and the dell teams together before we walked into the cave so we're standing in front of these like 20 foot tall arched wooden doors that are going into a hillside and i guess they were they're making wine in the winery and they were bringing it into the caves on forklifts and they had this kind of row of wine barrels that were sitting in front of the the cave and we thought well that would be a great photo op is so we'll all stand in front of the wine barrels with the big doors behind us and the hillside with the grapevines and the beautiful California golden sunlight, you know, on our faces and perfect photo op. So we're standing there, probably 15 of us or so. And how, how was this a field applications engineer that worked for Intel, but he called on Dell and lovely man, sometimes a pain in the ass, but I love you, Hal, you're probably listening to this. He reaches back and he puts his hand on the bung, which is like the rubber cork that goes into the wine barrel. And these wine barrels were probably under a lot of pressure because they were fermenting and they were in the hot sun. As soon as he touches that bung, as the photographer is taking the photo, the bung shoots out and a geyser of red wine shoots up like 10 feet in the air and rains down on all of these executives wearing like jackets and white shirts and slacks (laughs) and whatnot. And there's this fabulous series of photographs of us smiling and then a geyser of wine, and then us all like red from the wine on us, and then us all looking at how, like, what did you just do? <laughs> and needless to say, we all dined that night in the cave wearing like swag from the winery, like their polo shirts and fleeces <laughs> and stuff, because we were soaked from the wine. What a fantastic story. I'd be like Hitchcock that. I didn't know where the story was going, but <laughs> what a great ending. Please tell me that there was a picture still out there somewhere. You know, I just texted one of my friends before this because I knew you were going to ask that question. And I, I asked him, can you find that photo? And if I can find it, I'll send it to you. You can post it on your website. Brilliant. I will do that. 100%, man. And for anyone listening, just want to find out more information about the serious stuff we were talking about, about atom computing, about quantum, uh, the quantum race. What's the uh, best starting point for everything? www atom-computing.com is our website. We've got some reading materials there and some pointers to different tech papers and so forth. Uh, there's other resources available online. I, I would say, you know, IBM's Qiskit University is actually a pretty good place to get started in training. Um, they've written a software programming language that is kind of ubiquitous. We support that on our platform as well. So that's a good training resource as well. Well, there's so much talk at the moment about the quantum race, the importance of it, how transformative it's going to be. There's a lot of uh, talk about the complexity of the technology. So it was great to just demystify that today with you and also talk about things that we don't talk about enough, the importance of increased public funding, diversified investments, government partnerships, retaining talent, a seat at the table for startups and uh, expansion of quantum ecosystems regionally. I'd love to see how this continues to evolve. I will be waiting patiently for that photo of the red wine too. But more than anything, just thank you for sharing your story today. Thank you, Neil. I enjoyed it. And there you have it, a fascinating multifaceted discussion on the future of quantum computing. The complexities of retaining talent in a burgeoning field and the role of public and private sector collaboration. So Rob, thank you for joining us today and providing such an enlightening insights into not just what Atom Computing is doing, but how these practices and strategies could be the blueprint for securing America's position in that quantum race that we keep reading about. But I know we've got people listening all over the world today, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on anything we discussed and the role that your region is playing in that quantum race. And while technology promises profound benefits from revolutionising healthcare to optimising supply chains, the path ahead is fraught with challenges, and these range from ethical concerns, geopolitical standoffs, to the ever-present question of equitable access. But ultimately, the quantum race is not a sprint, it's a marathon, and only time will tell how policy and innovation will intersect to lead us into this new era. But that's it for me today, so stay curious, stay informed, and as always, let's keep demystifying technology. But thank you for listening, and until next time, don't be a stranger. <laughs>